everyone. How are you? <laughs> Dang, there's a lot of people here. I am so sorry for you. Um, <laughs> Hello, I am Duango AC. I am Keeper of Taskbot. If you are here, you probably are here for Taskbot and not me, but that's okay. To my right is my left hand man, I guess. I don't know what you are. Uh, this is Vi Great Tech. He is a person who has been helping me with all kinds of random craziness. I have some interesting news for you. This talk is all about failure. <laughs> um, Pretty much everything about this talk is not the way it was supposed to be, and that's just how it goes. So first I'm gonna show you something failing, and then I'll explain what's going on. So let me move over to this other view, which should in theory work, there we go. And I'm gonna show you what this what this run looks like. So we're gonna restart the game of Donkey Kong Country 2, and we have, we have this wonderful Rareware logo. Uh, you're gonna be seeing this a lot through the talk. I'm so sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> What this talk is about is the goal of being able to complete Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy Kong's Quest, which you can see right here. And I only just recently understood that that was a pun. I somehow never caught that it was Diddy's Conquest. Yeah, I just never caught that. So, so this is a tool assistant speedrun. Uh, if you can see this visualization board, this is showing you what buttons Taskbot is playing. And this was a run made by, who else was involved in this? I know P4 Plus 2 was involved. Total had some hand in making this. I think at some point Tampa optimized it. I don't know who else who has worked on this in the last three years. We have failed at getting this game working. We have been trying to get this specific game to succeed for over three GDQs. <laughs> In fact, if you go back and look at the original submissions for, I think it was AGDQ 2016, this game was on there. Um, it is raining. Okay, yes, it is literally raining. <laughs> All right, well, Taskbot and water doesn't mix, so we're gonna hope that that water that is falling from the ceiling stays over there. That is bizarre. Anyway, all right, so what's happening in this run? Um, insanity, this is stuff that you could do partially as a human in part, but it's not necessarily going to uh, to, to go well for you. Um, there are some precision movements that are happening here that are beyond anything that my skill level can handle. But for the most part, it's, it's a route that if you knew every trick in the game, you could, you could suss this out. Uh, you're going to be seeing this particular sequence of gameplay a lot. Because we're going to be failing through this repeatedly, so we'll probably back off the audio at some point because you get tired of it. So, we're now at this first boss fight. And we're gonna use a glitch here that you're not supposed to be able to do. And uh, throw him up there, which you're not supposed to do. And then throw that at him, which you're also not supposed to do. And uh, if you can see the stage, there are some blinking lights going on here. Uh, a lot of blinking lights. There's only one problem. Nothing else is happening. Welcome to my life. <laughs> So, I'm going to pause here. We're going to actually reset the console uh, because it's now going to be stuck. Uh, in fact, sometimes we have gotten it so stuck we had the power cycle. We've bricked the console before. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to pause and talk about what we just did and if we can pull down the game audio a little bit. So, basically, what you just saw was us attempting to end the game early. What we want to do is to tell the game that what it really wants to do is go run the end credits. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. We actually lodged the main CPU and left the audio processing unit totally intact. Now, I said that it was, this, this talk was about failure. Well, it's about a lot of failure. I don't know how we can get that to be Yeah, okay, well. As soon as we find the audio for the game, we'll turn it down a little bit. Um, because this is going to be going over and over and over again for the majority of the talk. You're going to understand why in a bit. Um, what we want to do is trigger a glitch in that file. Ah, that is so much better. Okay, you can just provide just a little bit of audio so you can hear in the background. All right. What we want to do is get to a point where we can jump to the end credits by tricking the game into running what we've pressed as buttons on the controller as code. And this is something we have done 
a few times, but the method that you get there with has a tendency to be very, very different. And this particular method isn't too complicated. There's only one minor problem. It does kind of do some stuff in what's called open bus. In other words, there's some, there's, uh, the way the SNES is constructed, there's this open bus where data can move back and forth, and we're basically smashing the ever-living daylights out of it. I just realized I totally turned my, moved my camera to my chest. You were just looking at, yeah, that isn't going to work. <laughs> Hi. I'm using the camera on my laptop because I can. Um, so what, what we want to be able to do is get open bus in the right state so that when we trigger this certain glitch, it runs the data from the controller ports as code, and so on and so forth. Eventually, we get a foothold and take over the entire video game console, because wouldn't that be awesome? There is some peculiarities about this that are a problem. We need it, to need it to happen on a very specific frame, because the state of memory needs to be in a very particular way. We know what that state of memory needs to be, because we ran this ahead of time in an emulator, in this case called LSNES. What we want in this particular case is for the exact frame to have exactly the right memory so that everything just magically works and instead of getting stuck on a blank screen, you're looking at the end credits. It has failed so badly, I haven't actually seen it succeed since Monday. <laughs> so the odds of it succeeding here are pretty low. Um, so you're, you're probably going to see this cycle, but what I want to do on this talk is demonstrate what it takes for us to do this type of content at a Games Done Quick event. So yet again, you're going to see lots of buttons pressing and it's probably just going to fail and I'll, I'll let it derp around in the corner for a little while. So let me back up quite a lot. I'm going to assume the vast majority of you do know who TaskBot is and what I'm talking about, but I realized that I kind of started the talk by jumping straight in, which is my typical method of doing things. So. I'm going to back up a bit and try to explain a little bit of how we got here. I am Duango AC. I am a member of the taskvideos.org website where we make tool-assisted speedruns. The idea is to do a fast completion of a video game, except use tools to make it faster than a human could ever do it. And the idea of doing a tool-assisted speedrun is to use an emulator, in our case we're using an SNES emulator called LSNES, to play the game in a way where you can pause at any time a place where you can analyze the state of the game, you can look into memory, you can maybe even, if you wanted to, look at the exact state of CPU registers. Most of the time you don't have to get that crazy, but you can. More than, more than anything, you have the ability to try again. It's like Groundhog Day. You try something, it doesn't work, you back up, you try it again. You can set a save state, try some risky thing. If it fails, it's no big deal. Hey, you ran into a Goomba, you fell down a hole, you were playing Donkey Kong and you got you lost one of your characters. Whatever the case may be, you can always back up and load your save state and try again. And you can do that as many times as you like. We call that process the process of making a re-record. And we store that information as, as people are making tool-assisted speedrun movie files or sequences of button presses. It's not uncommon to have tens of thousands of re-records of backing up and trying something again. As you might imagine, tool-assisted speedrun stuff has a funny tendency of attracting perfectionists, might be the right way to phrase it. Uh, we sometimes have members of our community that might be on the fringe of social norm. <laughs> um, OCD is pretty common, <laughs> but that's okay because what we're doing is eliminating human limitations. We're getting rid of problems with luck, with skill, with memory. We're making it so that we can perfectly force the game to do exactly what the game can do at its maximum ability. Or to say that in a better way, the programmers wrote the game to do a certain number of things, and there are a certain number of things they don't know the game is capable of doing, and we're really good at figuring those out. So what TaskBot is all about is taking a sequence of button presses made in an emulator and playing it back on a real console. But what I'm going to show you today is a fusion of the concepts that would normally be completely separate. Usually, what we have here on this console is a piano roll. We have, well, if you think of a piano, a player piano, you have a scroll of paper, or parchment, or whatever you want to call it, a scroll of paper, or maybe it's going to be metal plates, something like that with punches in it. Oh, this is a really bad desync. This is where things go very, very bad. <laughs> yeah. So you've got Taskbot derping in the corner, and he's probably going to die here in a second. He's constantly pausing. He's breakdancing. Yeah. This is not what we want to see. We want to make this not happen. 
We want to get a little bit farther and then fail. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, it didn't work for you. Um, I have a reset uh, wire connected to the underside of the console, so at any time I can just reset the console and try again. Um, okay, so if you think about a player piano, it's got a, usually a scroll of paper, a roll of paper that's, that's going through it, and it has punches in it that say what note to play, and it has a sequence of notes that just play in order. That's really all the Taskbot is doing. He is nothing more than effectively a fancy player piano, but instead of playing notes, he's playing back button presses. The only insight we have on this console is the console asking the controller, or in this case, Taskbot, who's connected to the controller boards, hey, what buttons are you holding? Latch. Hey, controller, I'm about ready to ask you what buttons you're holding. Tell me the first button. Is it being held? Tell me the second button. You have a predefined sequence of button presses. It just sends them all back a single serial line. I was always confused when I would look at a, a Super Nintendo cable or a Nintendo cable when I was a kid. I'm like, there's more than eight buttons on this controller, but I see like seven wires and maybe some shielding. I don't know. <laughs> How does this work? And the reason they did that was to make the cable not be too heavy. So they have this really interesting mechanism where they ask the controller, hey, are you ready? Yes, you're ready? Okay, give me the first button. Give me the second button. And it just gives one button at a time across the serial line. Just on an, a, a high voltage and low voltage. That's it. So Taskbot emulates that protocol. But the only thing that Taskbot can hear is that latch signal. The only signal coming back from the console is, hey, controller, I'm ready for the next frame of data. So if you've got 60 frames per second, as we do here in a game like Donkey Kong Country 2, you're going to be getting 60 times a second, hey, controller, or hey, Taskbot, give me the next button you want to press. That's all that we have. We don't have anything else. We don't have any other visibility to what's going on in this console. If you have your player piano and your paper jams, it's going to keep spinning, but you're pretty certain that what's going to happen is not going to sound very good, and it's not going to be very helpful. If we get off a frame, and Taskbot is trying to send the button presses for one frame, but he's actually on the next frame, and the enemy's in the wrong place, like you just saw earlier, he's just going to sit there derping in the corner, and it's going to go very badly for you. So I like to think of th what we're building here as, as a form of art. We're meticulously tweaking and changing and, and altering what things look like to get to a point where it looks pleasing to the eye, where it looks, well, that's a new one. <laughs> uh, it, it, came it, back it did happen one time earlier today. You just weren't there for it. <laughs> yeah, that happens. OK, well, we'll try again. Try, try again. Occasionally, the screen will get artsy looking. Artsy looking. That's almost what we want. Artsy looking. Yeah. Um, so I call it art because a lot of times you can move the characters on the screen in a way that aren't, it would not be normal. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it to behave that way. A human player couldn't do the things we are able to do. So we're able to do creativity in, our, in a leisurely pace ahead of time to make something that looks awesome. Uh, okay, we're okay. Um, I call it art because it really is art to me. It's someone who meticulously sat there working on trying to find the most interesting combination of button presses. Uh, oh, I should really change this. My text is so totally wrong. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that text. And uh, do you guys want me to leave the dancing cheerleader down there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you ever want to see any more of this, come to twitch.tv slash AC, or just look up Taskbot on Twitch. I'm always doing something stupid like this. <laughs> so let me back up. I consider this art. What happened? Uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're back. All right. No, I, yeah, I, I breathed on it. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm easily distracted, and we're several levels of recursion deep now on distraction. So let me wind back there. Um, if you look at some speedruns, some tool-assisted speedruns, sometimes we take our art very literally. Who here has seen Taskbot play Brain Age? Okay, there's a lot of hands in the audience right now. Brain Age was the epitome of making a tool-assisted speedrun that was art. We literally hooked into a physical Nintendo DS, hacked into the touch, resistive touch screen, and moved the stylus around the screen, 
Instead of answering math questions like what is 5 plus 5 as 10, we simply drew a dog's head and the game accepted it as the right answer because we gave it the right one. Um, we manipulated it into thinking that was the right answer. And we literally made actual art. That was the most recognizable form of art. But what we're doing here I would also consider to be art. I really feel passionately about this as, as an art form that's just nascent and not understood yet. And in a lot of ways, it's like all art. If you think about art in music or art on a canvas, a lot of times what we as humans consider art is taking someone else something, something, taking something else that existed before, changing it in some unique way, or showing it in some unique viewpoint, and demonstrating it as a new work of art. And you see this in music by sampling. People sample old sound effects all the time. Really, all we're taking is a game that Nintendo made, and we're doing completely new things with it. And I really feel strongly that it is an interesting form of art. Now, art is sometimes really, really hard, because what you don't see when you see the final Mona Lisa, or you see the final song, or hear the final song, or hear the final composition on a stage of, of an audiovisual presentation, what you don't see is how often someone failed before they got to that final product. And what you're seeing right now is three years of us trying to get this game working and failing over and over and over again. So we wanted to not fail because we want to show art. We want to show what we could do with this console at the point that we could get total control of it. So I'm going to demonstrate to you, with a couple of screenshots and some with help from Vigray Tech, I'm going to show you some of the ways that we've been trying to suss out what has been going on here. Um, so I'm going to start with a different view. Yeah. Okay. While you do that, um, while the controllers are blinking, and I don't know exactly what's going on in those those button presses, but in many of the task bot runs before, uh, what happens, the game crashes, as you can see. At that moment, normally a controller is asked what button in uh, uh, inputs are being pressed every frame. So in this case, 60 frames per second. Uh, in particular crashes, we can tell the game, what button are you pressing? What button are you pressing? Oh, it's not a new frame? What button are you pressing? What button are you pressing? Over and over and over again. Many, many times a frame. Yeah. There have been multiple times where there's, at least with one of the projects I've done, uh, I believe 32 times a frame was just normal. Yeah, we managed to shove 1.5 megabits of data through the controller ports one time. <laughs> Continuously. <laughs> If you have not seen AGDQ 2017, it's worth looking at because it was insane. Okay, so I'm going to walk through this one more time. I, I, I told you, you were going to be so sick of this run by the time it's over. Um, I'm going to hit Control-C here. I'm going to show you on the screen with much money. Well, that did not work. Uh, okay, we're going to make this a lot bigger. I could. No, no, that's smaller, not bigger. Again. That's better. Okay. okay. Let me get this to the point that it is not obscene here. I will also say this is very common for many of Duango's streams. Yes, this is this is a common, common thing. I do this kind of stupid stuff all the time. I might have, maybe I made that a little too big. <laughs> I made it too big. But let's let's back that off just a notch. Yeah, that's still visible, right? You can see that? Okay. Alright. Let's let's not mess this up anymore. Alright. So what I got going on here is a script, Python 3, it's a Python 3 script. Uh, it's running a program we, we named TaskTM32.py. This was made by the Moss 3212 based on a board designed by Onosaurus. So Taskbot is holding this, this circuit board over here. That is the TaskTM32 board. We're saying, it's saying that the console is SNES, the players are, and bear with me, one, two, five, and six. I'll explain why it looks like that in a second. It makes sense. Overread is because Donkey Kong Country 2 is evil. So, believe it or not, there are 16 buttons on a Super Nintendo controller. If you actually look at the controller, there's only 12 buttons, but the game, or the console, asks the controllers for 16 buttons, even though there's only 12. So, what 
what it what it's basically doing is sending back some extra data that is always static on a normal controller. But you can set them to whatever you like if you're Taskbot, um, which we do. Um, but sometimes it asks 17 times in one frame, and we don't particularly know why DKC2 is so brain dead as to ask for more buttons than it could possibly have, but it does somehow do that. Anyway, so that overread manages to get around that. The soft reset is the magical thing that makes it so that when I hit enter on this, it will automatically nuke the uh, nuke the console or the reset the console. It'll it'll hold a reset line down and, and let the game restart. So we're gonna do that now. All right, sending latches. This is where I mentioned that the console was saying, hey, controller, latch. I'm about to ask you what buttons you're pressing. So every time we receive a latch, we know to send the next bit of data. Now, this is just updating every 100 latches, uh, which is about, a little, since there's 60 latches a second in general, it's, a little, bit, it's about a, a little bit more than a second and a half or so, somewhere in there. Um, math is hard for me. So. What you're watching right now is just the script playing back blindly. The only thing it knows is the signal coming back from the console saying, "Hey, I, I latch. I want to uh, want to press the next button. I want, I want, I want the next uh, next button you want to press." So this is going to more than likely fail. So rather than making you you go through the whole thing again, I'm going to show you something different, which is this latch train business. Now this is where things get kind of weird. We know from when we recorded this on the emulator that we should have a certain number of frames and then a lag frame where the console does not ask us for input. That, that is an interesting situation. When I'm going to run this right now, and you'll actually see these latch trains happen here. What this means is that the game asked for button presses for, say, four frames in a row, and then it had a lag frame where it did not ask the controller for input at all. And the reason that happened is because it was too busy processing something. Now, right here it says off by many frames run is probably broken. That's not a good sign. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, it's probably going to desync, but we'll see. Yeah, that, that's a desync. We've already seen, well, Duengo and myself have seen that exact failure multiple times, specifically when we have the latch trains. Yeah. Is this the right payload? <laughs> we have gotten it to crash successfully, like you guys have seen, yeah. a few times with that particular one. Let's use this one. Overread software set. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. Yeah, I, I, I went back to the other one. So, all right, this latch train business. Here's what we know, and this is where this went from a kind of tame but completely unintelligible talk to a brace yourselves, there's some real tech you're going to learn today about how the Super Nintendo works. And it's going to be cool. On the Super Nintendo, there are actually two sets of, of, of CPUs. Or not, you can think of two processors. One is the main CPU, and the other one is the APU. I see people leaving the room, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, I've scared them off with my tech. Um, so the main CPU is running off of a quartz crystal clocked at 21 megahertz. The audio processing unit, the APU, oh, I forgot there's still chat on screen. <laughs> oh, what did they say? <laughs> Front row person, where exactly are you say? Oh my goodness, hang on. You guys are having way, way, way too much fun. I, uh, oh man, all right. So, um, apparently people who are frequenting my stream realized that they could type on my stream because I forgot to turn the chat off. <laughs> so there are people in the front row, apparently, <laughs> currently typing messages in chat because they can. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> See, this is how easy it is to nerd snipe. This is why no talk ever goes the way I want. If you want to see this kind of thing happen more frequently, pop on my Twitch stream. It's like this every time. Um, so, all right, back to what I was saying. Uh, I'm just going to let it be right over the top of my face. You guys can deal with it. Uh, <laughs> we'll leave chat up. Just no swearing, OK? So the main CPU is a 21 megahertz uh, quartz crystal driving the main CPU. The audio processing unit, the APU, is running on a 24.576 megahertz ceramic oscillator. It's the same idea, but it's built cheaper. And it doesn't need to be as precise. 
it didn't matter to Nintendo if your C note was ever so slightly off pitch, no one would notice. Now, we care a lot. <laughs> because, as you have possibly seen in this latch train business, sometimes the number of frames that go by between lag frames, it gets kind of funny. Sometimes it's not exactly what it expects, so it has to dynamically add or remove extra frames to get back into alignment. We're basically saying we were expecting at this point to have 77 frames in a row without a lag frame. Instead of one lag frame, we got two, so we know we need to compensate. We need to, at this point where there was a lag frame, we need to send the data, or maybe there was more than one lag frame in a row, we need to send the data earlier than we would have otherwise. Or, hey, we didn't see a lag frame where we expected to see one, we're gonna add an extra frame of, of not sending input so that the random number generation sequence gets back to in, in line. We're still somewhat blind, we're basing it entirely off of information we got on the emulator side. So we've got this latch train stuff, where it says 4, 19, 633, 122, 77, all of this stuff right here. All the, these are sequences of frames that we're expecting to be asked for, and then a break. So here we're going to see 605 frames and then a break. If we don't see the right number, well, okay, let's try to compensate. So, what have we learned? We have learned that this has to be dynamically uh, adjusted sometimes. So we have these latch train successes, that's when no modifications whatsoever need to be made. Sometimes you'll see it say added a frame, sometimes you'll see it skipped a frame. But we still haven't yet made it to a point of success. Something is still not quite right. So we need to get more information about what's going on here to understand what to do next. And that's where things get a lot more geeky. Because here's why it's sometimes off a different amount. I mentioned that sometimes we need to add a frame or remove a frame. The reason that we need to do that is because of those two clocks I was describing earlier before I got distracted. You've got the main CPU running at 21 megahertz. You've got the sound processor, the audio processing unit, the APU running at 24.576 megahertz. Those are not divisible even remotely. And the processor, the main CPU has to send stuff to the APU. It's audio data, audio samples, audio commands, music cues, things like that. It has to send that over and then get a response back to say, yes, I'm done. Here's where things get interesting. There you go, see, a, a short of frame, adding a frame to compensate. That's a situation where the, what, I, what I'm about to describe happened. What happened there is the audio was sent from the main CPU to the audio processing unit, and the CPU stopped and waited for the audio processing unit to be done, because you don't want to start playing a sound effect that doesn't exist yet, it would sound bad. So, it waited, and it had to wait one more frame than it normally would. Why? Well. For some reason, the APU took just a little bit longer that time to process that audio sample, and it didn't send the response back in time. So that bled into the next frame. That means that the exact sequence of RNG, the exact location of enemies, wasn't where we expected it to be, and it resulted in a desynchronization. What we're doing here, you might not even notice that it's desynchronized, because there's not exactly a lot of, of frame precision here. We're sort of jumping around a level it doesn't have to be exact, it can be off a little bit, and it's all right. But when we get to that critical point where we're trying to take over the console, it matters a lot. We have to have everything perfect. So, in this particular run, we've now made two frame adjustments. So the earlier runs I was showing you at the beginning of the talk were just blind. This one, we at least have some amount of data to work from. Is it enough data? <sighs> Apparently not, because we're still floundering. We're still... Oh, hey, check that out. Uh, it stopped moving, didn't it? It stopped latching. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, they're all lit up. Uh, so, remember how I said that the console says, hey, controller, give me the next button presses? It stopped asking. <laughs> <laughs> I would make a joke about the lights being on, but no one being home, but that joke's already been made. Um, so, we're just going to try canceling this, and again, I'm using this soft reset uh, right here. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. Right here, the soft reset. This allows us to automatically reset, hold on the reset line, start the run, and let go of the reset line to start it quickly. Let's see if this recovers. Okay. I have seen it broken so badly that it doesn't recover. Okay, we're all right. Now, now that we've done that, we're going to do... It's okay. We're going to do that again, but this time, I'm going to focus on... Let's, let's resize this a little bit. So you'll still see the stuff at the top, but I'm going to show you one other thing. 
all right, we need more visibility into what's going wrong. We can do this repeatedly in an emulator without any problem, but on the real hardware, we're just not getting what we want. Even when we're readjusting on the fly based on what the number of, of latches were since we, we, since we ex how do I say this? The number of frames that went by that were consecutive without a lag frame that didn't ask the controller for button presses. We know what the order of that should be, and we've got it all calculated out here at the top. Now what we want to do is go one step further and really peek into what's going on in this game. So the more astute viewers in the front of the room might have noticed that the console I am playing with has a cartridge in it that is not Donkey Kong Country 2. Now, I legally own multiple copies of Donkey Kong Country 2. I have Donkey Kong Country 2 version 1.0. I have Donkey Kong Country version 1.1. I have DKC2 unknown because we never did figure out what it was. It might be some as of yet unreleased and undumped one. We don't know yet. Um, this is the exact same game, but we're using a flash card called the SD to SNES. And you might notice something coming out of the top of it. This is a USB cable that's going back to my laptop. And with that, we are able to do some fun stuff. Uh, do you want to talk about that at all? Or do you want to just dive straight in with the demo? Um, so, uh, there's a friend of ours who, unrelated uh, individual, but has done things similar in tech standard. Uh, Jakku, who has done crowd control. Uh, you may have heard of it before, so people can play A Link to the Past and have the Twitch chat mess with what's going on. Um, the way uh, the way crowd control works on a console like this is the, the computer, well, the streamer's equipment needs to know what the memory values are of the game. So it can either manipulate the memory or read the memory or interact with the memory in some sort of way. Uh, so with this USB cable nonsense going on, uh, now we have access to the entire memory of the CPU. Yes, and we're going to use that. Uh, let me hop down here and hit enter on this. Okay, so um, this was actually run at the wrong time, wasn't it? Oh, well. uh, yeah. It's okay. So what we're doing now is we're reading from the memory of, of the console, and we're comparing it against an oracle. The oracle was the uh, okay, let me re-explain that word. An oracle is something that tells you what you should have. <laughs> so in the emulator LSNES, we previously ran through a script that dumped the sequence of RNG values in the game Donkey Kong Country 2 from the very run we're watching now into a text file. It was just a long text file of here's the sequence of memory addresses we expected. Um, mm, I'm actually going to restart after this. Well, okay, I'm just... I'll explain the RNG thing yeah, just a little bit for a little idea. bit of we'll context. Bit. So when when you press a, a button in games or the amount of frames it takes between pressing buttons, like once you start up the console, you can wait three and a half seconds exactly and press start. Now a game might react slightly differently than had you pressed start within the first second of it turning on. Uh, there isn't really great randomness in these old systems, so it has to rely on things that you don't really have much control of, like sub-second button presses, the exact order of button presses, how much time you take between button presses. So each frame, we could have different random number generator, well, random number generation values, and that can cause enemies to move slightly differently. They might turn to the right one frame earlier or later. Uh, another enemy might appear on the screen in a different location. Uh, the bird will probably move in a slightly different fashion. Things like that. And this is where I said that tool assistant speedruns allow you to break past the point that a human would, would be able to accomplish. We can do things at such precision that we can always provide the exact same sequence of button presses, which means we always get the exact same sequence of RNG values. But what are those RNG values? Well, let's go find out, because we can read it live. All right, so we're going to do this again, and this time we'll talk about the bottom. Now, I'm not too worried about that first fail. So the uh, where it says, uh, like, 0x, well, now they're moving too fast. Um, <laughs> 
Where it says OK and it's in green, that's something he coded up to be, uh, um, well, OK, hang on. I only did the colors. There's, he did the colors. There's so <laughs> many other people that have been involved yeah. in this. Hi, I am Duango AC, Keeper of Taskbot. I can't do any of this crap. <laughs> <laughs> I am completely reliant on people far more intelligent than me. Um, the only thing I know how to do is this weird layout stuff and, and making Linux do stupid things and yeah, OBS and how to talk at a microphone sort of kind of when I'm not really tired like I am now. Um, so what, um, what I rely on is people with niche skills to help pull everything together to do the crazy things you see us do at Games Done Quick events. Now, in this case, we're looking at code written by a guy named Total who helped us get the data out of the USB to SNES uh, itself. The SD to SNES has a, uh, a USB port on it. A guy named Red Guy made the USB to SNES library, which Total then used to get the raw data values, which a guy last night named Adam, yes. Adam Antoys. Adam Antoys, thank you. Helped write the script. This looks very different than it did last night, doesn't it? Yeah, you are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he did the majority of the work to make it say OK, to make it say fail, basically make it easy to parse it. What he did is made it pretty. <laughs> um, so this kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're actually off a little bit. We're reading a couple of different values here. One of the values we read earlier was the active frame counter in the game, which kind of cycles over and it's not very consistent. It doesn't make much sense, but it is what it is. So we got this active frame counter. That's that first number, like uh, 4089 at the bottom of the screen, where it says got 4375 here. And every time that active frame counter updates uh, or RNG changes, we're showing the, the memory value of RNG. Um, certain things cause that RNG seed value to change. Ooh. Yeah. There we go. I said sometimes things will get slightly artsy. This is one of those times. Mm -hmm. We, must, we might have. I'm, I'm going to leave it alone for a second. So, all right, we've got everything on one screen. We've got, at the very top, it says got 3596, and it's kind of a teal color. It says OK, minus one. What that one means to us is that what the console did was a frame, is, I think it's earlier, I think. I think it's a frame earlier, or a, uh, an active frame earlier, the in-game idea of a frame earlier than what, what really happened on the console. Um, green means that it matched up with the emulator perfectly. Red is bad. That means that we got a memory value in RNG that should have never been there. That sometimes happens when we crash the game this bad, uh, which is kind of entertaining that this happens. So we're going we're to cancel that, run it again. Okay. S so much running it again. <laughs> um, it didn't hard crash. It did not hard crash. There's that. Uh, now, we hope that by looking at the RNG sequence in memory and comparing it against the RNG sequence from the emulator, that we can start to incorporate additional changes to try to narrow down on why is this going so badly. We're peeking into the raw console live as it's going and trying to modify what we're doing. It's not exactly artificial intelligence, but it is definitely adaptive. This is not the kind of stuff I signed up for in 2013. I just wanted to play Super Mario Brothers and have people be entertained. And suddenly we decided, hey, let's break the game. Um, there's a whole class of things we'd like to be able to do with the Super Nintendo that we've gone to great lengths to try to do it with an unmodified con console. We're already cheating a little bit by using a cartridge that allows us to sniff memory. But at a certain point, we just don't have any options left. This hardware is 30 years old, and as a digital preservationalist, I don't want to see this stuff die. I want to restore this back to the state it was in when the software developer was given a spec and told program to that. And the hardware does not behave the way the spec was, was written. It, that's, uh, it is just how it is. This console has aged for 30 years, and that ceramic oscillator doesn't behave the same way as it used to. So how do we get back to that point of being able to show what the developer of this game thought was going to happen when they wrote the code? How do we get back to a point where there's that same consistency, where we're rewinding the clock? We've tried replacing the ceramic oscillator, but that alone was not enough. There's a lot of other components, a lot of other capacitors that are 
changing over, over time. We have some consoles that behave worse than others. I actually looked at a console yesterday that uh, BritMob here in the front row no, was it was it your console? Yeah, no, it was uh, Mellows. Actually, it was Mellows right here. Mellows lent us a console. It is so bad, it takes seven to ten seconds at every screen transition. We have no idea why. And the worst part is, that's my best And that's his best looking console. It's crazy. We don't know why. Uh, ooh. Ooh. Oh. Oh. It stopped. Why did you? <laughs> I will I will say this is the first time at that point that I have not seen it say fail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it also says over 4000 frames difference. That's on the... That probably means that it got a memory value it once had before and then didn't like it. Um all right, I'm going to close this uh, off by saying this. We know what we want to do. We want to have a console that behaves the way the software developer expected it to work. And we don't have that right now. What are we going to have to do to get to that point? Well, we're going to have to start making deeper and deeper cuts and modifications. We don't really want to stray too far away from what the original console was, but there's probably some changes we're going to need to make. Especially for the consistency we need, one of the things we need is a very repeatable, it took this long to move the data from the CPU to the audio processing unit and to get a message back from the APU. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to make it take a long time every time. Not like a ridiculously long time, not comically long, just a reasonably long time. And then make it always take that reasonably long amount of time. In other words, if the original software developer was given a spec that said it could take this amount of time to finish, we're going to go to that level, and we're going to put in a circuit that delays the response back from the APU saying, I'm done, until that last possible moment. Yes, it will introduce lag frames. Those lag frames were already expected by the software developer. They knew that they could happen. Yes, it will technically make the run take a little longer, but certainly no worse than what you were going to have to deal with if you were playing this game on your own as a human. With that change in place, we hope to get to a point where games like this don't need all of this bizarre dynamic changing. It'll just work deterministically. And that will unlock things on the Super Nintendo that we cannot currently show. I want to use this payload on Sunday. We've been at this for an hour. I haven't seen a success yet. <laughs> the, now, interestingly, my, the main dev, dev of the TAS TM32 board, the replay device that TASBot is holding right now, Onosaurus has a console that works one out of every three to five attempts. He says seven attempts in a row of failing would be a 1% chance on this console. Obviously, we're not having that kind of luck. <laughs> so, what are we gonna do? I don't know. We'll find out. Come to MAGFAST Sunday morning, 9 a.m. to find out what we do. <laughs> it could be nothing. Um, I'm gonna allow you to say whatever you wanna say, and then we're, gonna, we're at a good stopping point for questions. Um, it's, it's definitely been a very long day. Yes. Um, <laughs> We had a lot of fun ideas and a lot of uh, problems along the way, and honestly, very little sleep while all of us are trying to figure this out. We have so many people, not only across the United States, across the world, trying to figure these things out. Yes, it is a total pain in the butt sometimes. So, the show will go on, even if we have to write our own custom game and then put it on a flash cart. Like, that's not what we want to do, but we will do that if we have to. I just want to point out, what you see at an AGDQ is the result of many, many, many man hours, sometimes man years of effort. I cannot tell you how many volunteers we had making art for Brain Age or how many hours of effort Micro 500 put in to animating every single drawing in Brain Age. The, the AGDQ 2015 payload of Pokemon Red, Pokemon Plays Twitch, that run alone, we estimate, took a man year of effort amongst the whole team. People like Ilari and Micro 500 at the time, P4 Plus 2, a whole host of other people like Master June, 
So many people put time into this at that time. In fact, if I were to try to name everyone who has helped out, it's nearly impossible. I can tell you, if you have any interest in what we're doing here and you want to be part of this community, head on over to discord.tas.bot or just look up TaskBot on, on, on Discord. You'll find us. Come be part of our community. It's okay if you don't have these crazy skills. You'd be surprised what you can do. <laughs> I'm actually still looking for someone to run the uh, the Twitter account. If you, if you want to do that, that would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shouldn't take too much technical work. But um, a lot of what we do is failing and failing and failing again. And the only thing that makes us any different than anyone else is persistence. We just don't give up. It's hard sometimes doing all of this, but it's very, very rewarding. In 2019, we did... <laughs> let's see. Well, Bot Bash Charity Brawl sort of fled in, fall, fell into 20, 2019 as well. We had a, uh, MAGFest 2019, AGDQ 20, uh, 2019, Desert Tesla Charity Drive, which was crazy because imagine doing everything you see here but in a car, <laughs> going across the desert with a 200 watt budget. That was entertaining. Um, we did RPG Limit Break. We did European Speedrunner Assembly. Summer Games Done Quick 2019. Uh, MagWest Go. We did like seven different major events last year. It was the most insane year ever. And out of that, we helped raise over $282,000 for charity. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm just the organizer and the presenter and the guy that gets on stage and tells you what the rest of the team did. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, come be part of our community. There's always some place that we need help here and there. I'd love to have you.